And, uh, you know, I've been trying this, been trying this new thing, trying to thank the band for leading us in worship and stuff and name them by name so that you guys are familiar with them as well. But, you know, um, each week, I don't think any of you guys have these songs memorized or anything like that. And, you know, the, the whole way that you're able to do this little, uh, karaoke worship thing that we do is uh, because of people like on our media team and you don't ever get to see them because they just have a glowing face in the background right now but um, you know like right now we Adam and Sarah are back there doing our online ministry and making sure these slides are accurate and you know fixing my misspellings that you know end up being curse words in the presentation and stuff like that and so anyway can we thank them for everything that they do back there And two, the, the, the unsung hero, our little Viking, uh, Jason Riappel for the sound. Um, yeah. He does a good job too, right? He's great. Um, and so you can thank him for the loud noises that go into your ears. But um, I'm going to pre-warn you right now. Um, I had a sermon prepared for this because I, as Ashley said, we were, we were gone all week. We left Monday. We got back late Friday night. And so I had a message prepared and I was diligent because I knew as soon as we got back, we would be preparing for mother, son and all that. And then, um, you know, you go to a conference and God starts to speak to you and I just threw it all out. And so, um, there were 15 hour days. We'd usually start at seven 30 in the morning and we'd end at like 10 o'clock at night. And so I want to say that to say everything that is about to be said was written at Thursday night at about between midnight and 1 AM in a hotel lobby. And I am still sleep deprived. And so if anything comes off, uh, weird, that's why. All right. So. Let's begin. All right. Cool. So uh, we did. We went to this conference, and it was a next-gen conference. It was all about um, the next generation from birth to, to young adults, and a lot of it was b about uh, the cultural shift that's taking place in our world. And I, I wanted to highlight some things that we learned about, and, and I think a lot of this stuff you will already know, you've already experienced this will just help you put words to some of it. And so here's a couple shifts that are, are happening in our culture and in our world, specifically in the United States. But we are going through a time of existential crisis. We no longer live in a modern world. We live in a postmodern world. Remember when we were in school and social studies, we would learn about the Renaissance era, you know, all of these different times where the culture would shift and the culture would change and the philosophy would change. You're, you're in the middle of that. You're in the middle of a page turn and a new chapter is literally beginning and it's happening with this generation, with your children's generation, with our generation, with your grandchildren's generation. And one of the things is um, technology. We are living in a hyper-reality world where the world is no longer able to keep up with the world. Technology is literally obsolete by the time that it hits the shelves now. So by the time that they develop an iPhone and then they put the iPhone on the shelf, they've already developed a new OS, new technology. They already know, they're already working on making the next one and making it better, which is why your cell phone only works for about four years and then it goes kaput because that's the kind of world that we live in. Technology is raging at a speed that we can't even keep up with. Along with that, there are other things like AI and AI is out. And we're going, well, what are, we, what, are, what are the implications of AI and what does this mean? And we're like, well, we don't know, but we don't have time to stop and think about that. We just need to start using it. But there are questions that we should be asking. Yeah. Like, should we? Is it useful? Is it helpful? Is it maybe stealing our intellectual property? We don't know, but we haven't stopped to have that conversation, right? So... This is one of the crises that we're involved with. The other thing is that we are in an algorithm echo chamber. Did you know that in 1983, that 90% of the media was controlled by 50 separate companies? Today, in 2024, 90% of the media is controlled by six companies. And of those six companies, there are four investment groups that control 100% of those six companies. 
That's where your information is coming from. That's where your articles are coming from. And then on social media, it gets even worse. Because of the top five social media platforms, three of them are owned by the same company. And those same companies are controlled by the investment funds that control that media. And so today, here's what has happened. You know how all these social media apps are free? Free to use? You know why they're free to use? It's because you're the product. You're the product. And the thing that's being exchanged, the currency, is your personal information. And you're being studied. And you're being watched. And you're, they're trying to understand you to better know what gets your attention. And so we are stuck in this algorithm echo chamber where even if you wanted to possibly explore new ideas or different ideas or another person's opinion, these platforms literally won't let you. Because the minute that you watch a video for longer than three seconds, you have been lumped into a group. And in about ten clicks, you've gone from watching cats on the internet to a political ad. <laughs> and that's how you got there. Because of these algorithm echo chambers that we live in. And they have been so divisive in our country. The other thing is this. This was a new term that I learned. K-G-O-Y. It is kids getting older, younger. Kids getting older, younger. Today, the average age that a child gets a cell phone is the age of 10. And with that comes access to YouTube and online gaming and internet and TikTok and social media and Snapchat and all of these different algorithm echo chambers that we just talked about. And it's showing it's showing. Today, our Gen Z is prescribed more antidepressants than in, in American history. This is the most suicidal generation that we've ever seen. This, year, this last year, the amount of homicides in our country among Gen Z were lower than the amount of suicides. Suicides have overtaken homicide in our country. And these are some of the reasons why. We're also in a time, a time where structures are being torn down. There's widespread deconstruction that is going on. Now, I've been aware of this in the church. Deconstruction has been a word that I've, we've heard a lot about, people deconstructing their faith. And I've understood that and read up a lot about that. What I didn't know is that the church is not the only institution where this is happening. Every institution is being deconstructed. Is public school the best place for my child to learn? I don't know so much anymore. And so the desire to homeschool and to find public schools or different alternatives, because we don't trust the school system anymore. I mean, what we've been through in the pandemic doesn't even feel like at times you can trust your doctor. Because sometimes you'll go to your doctor and you'll say something and you'll say how you'll feel and they'll say, ah, it's just in your head or just that. And then you go to a specialist and run these tests on your thyroid or your testosterone and stuff. And they'll be like, yeah, actually you were right. Well, why didn't my general doctor tell me that? And so you start to deconstruct. Like, can I even trust doctors anymore? Or can I, you know, like who am I supposed to believe? And, you know, then this came out about this vaccine and it's like we're even deconstructing that. But not even that, even the government police. I mean, there's so many institutions that people don't know what to believe and they don't know who to trust. And so they're deconstructing all of it. And the church is included in that. Then also there's a rise of the spiritual. If you talk to Gen Z or Gen A, somebody under the age of 30, the majority of them will tell you that they are a spiritual person, but not a religious person. This is a new trend, especially in America. If you talk to a large amount of young people, they'll tell you, I, I'm a spiritual person. I, I'm on a spiritual journey, and I believe that there's something out there, but I don't know exactly what that is, and I'm okay with that. And so I believe that I'm a spiritual person, but I don't belong to one specific church or denomination or religion. And I honestly think that's best because to go back to the deconstruction side, they don't believe they can trust the institution. So the church or that denomination or that religion. But they'll tell you, I'm a spiritual person and I do spiritual things. But then also the family, the family is being redefined 
as well. 1.2 million children currently in the United States have zero association with any blood relatives. So if you go to school, or even if you go back to our kids' department, there's a high probability that you will find a child who does not know their parents, does not know their grandparents, doesn't know their aunts, uncles, cousins. They have zero affiliation. So when you talk about family and family values, this generation says, what, what family are we talking about? I made my own family. I've chosen my own family. Because my real family, mm-mm, they're not worth it. Or they didn't care. So we're going through a time where all of these structures and things that were supposed to make America great either are being torn down or don't exist. And we're going through a time, a time where we don't believe we can change things. And I'll be honest, when they said this, I felt this. (laughs) I felt this. I'll be very honest and transparent with you. Like as a millennial, I'm looking at November and I'm going, what's the point? You, got, you gave me one old guy who can't form a sentence and one old guy who has a whole nother bag of deals. So, like, this is my choices? <laughs> Great. I've, we've already lived this dance. So, fantastic. So, what's the point? Some of you have been through this, man. You have worked so hard. You've had dreams and aspirations. You've wanted to buy a house or, 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 or do something in your life or achieve something. But it just doesn't matter sometimes, does it? It just feels like it doesn't matter how hard you try or how much you save. They change the game, they change the rates, they change the rules, and it just feels like a game you can't ever win, doesn't it? And you go, what is the point? What, like, what's the point of even caring or even trying? Because I'm always going to get the short end of the stick. So we're at a time where this generation, part, and partially I think mine too, where we're just going, what's the point? We can't change things. I remember when I was a kid, I was a teenager, when Columbine happened. And it was a horrible, horrible incident. But now, today, you hear about a school shooting about every other week. And you're going, hmm, another one. Not surprised. Yep. Yeah. It happens. This generation, this generation is numb to it. Amen? <laughs> Our generation is just numb to it. And in the middle of this shift that's happening, and in the middle of what we're experiencing, there are four temptations, four temptations that we could potentially fall into. And the four temptations are this. The first thing we could do is we could just deny it. We could just deny it. We could just reject it, right? Hey, uh, this, is, this is what your kid's doing. I don't know if you're aware of this. Hey, your political candidate, the guy who you're holding the flag for, this is, this is what found out they did. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is what I saw them doing. This is what my experience was. And, and in the words of Dave Chappelle, I don't think they did it. And if they did, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's what we do, right? That's what you see other people do. That's what you see other parents do. Did you know your kid? <laughs> I don't think they did. <laughs> And if they did, I'm not going to say anything, <laughs> you know. This is what the guy, you, this person you look up to, well, this is what they did. I, I don't think it's true. I don't trust anybody. You can't trust the media. You can't trust the, you know, so we, 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 de- we deny it, we reject it. The other thing that we could do is we could just avoid it. Anybody, this, I think we all, we, we all do this. Anybody have that friend in your friend group and you all see what they're doing? You all see how things, like you see the direction that they're headed. You see the direction that their kid's headed. Like you know how the story is going to end. And you're like, hmm, somebody should say something. And sometimes your whole friend group sees it or your whole, you know, your whole arena, your whole family. You all see it. And you turn to your friend and you go, are you going to say anything? No, I'm not going to say anything. Are you going to say anything? Nope. All right. See you at Thanksgiving. You know, it's just, we're just going to avoid it. We're not going to say anything about it. We're not going to bring it up. We just leave them be. You know, you do you. So we just avoid it. We avoid those hard conversations. We avoid going and maybe seeing a counselor and dealing with the issue. We avoid having our kid 
possibly be tested, even though everybody kind of sees the same kind of things, but we just don't want to deal with it. We don't want to know, so we think if we don't know, we don't have to deal with it, so we'll just avoid that, right? We avoid, we avoid, we avoid. And the other thing we could do is we could cover it, which, oh boy, we see a lot of cover-ups today, don't we? Amen. See a lot of things where we just go, just don't look at it. <laughs> just look over here. Change the channel. Did you hear what P. Diddy did? Look over here, you know? Just look over here. Isn't that crazy? You know, I'll tell you this. This is so crazy. So, you know, a couple months ago, we told you that our theme for this year was we're here for it, right? And I'll tell you, this came from this conference. Ashley and I signed up for this conference, and, we're like, and they told us, they emailed us, here's the theme for this year's conference. We're here for it, and here's what it means. And I said, oh, my gosh, Ashley, this is so good. I love this. You know what? That, oh, that's so us. You know what? We're going to make this the theme for us this year. We're going to be here for it. We're going to be here for it, too. And then we did that sermon, and we told you, you ought to be here for it, and we've used that language and stuff. So then we're going to this conference, and we're like, oh, boy, we're really going to be here for it, right? And, and what was crazy for us is ever since we preached on that, and we said we were here for it, and we did that whole rah-rah thing, that's when stuff started hitting the fan, okay? We're like, we're here for it. And then, like, we had a baby prematurely born at, like, 24 weeks. There was a teen homicide situation, Y'all had things happen in your life. There's been more tears shed upstairs in the studio in the past two months than I think in the history of this building. And this history dates back pretty far. I mean, all kinds of stuff happened. And me and Ashley and the staff were looking at each other going, we're here for it. But are we? Because <laughs> it seems like when we say that, all this stuff is happening, you know? And so this week, we're going to this conference, and we're kind of like, I, they better explain what it really means to be here for it. <laughs> Because I didn't sign up for all this, you know. And five days before the conference, Ashley and I get an email at 8 o'clock at night. The founder of this organization, who I've personally followed for over a decade, got to see him preach many, many times. He's a pastor, stand-up guy. And then the CEO of the company, we get an email that the two in an investigation, they found out they had an affair. And they had both resigned. So it's five days before this conference, we find out that the founder and the CEO had had an affair, and they both resigned. So I text Ashley when she gets done with youth group, did you see this email? And oh my gosh, it just it deflated us. I was just like, oh, I don't even know if I want to go, you know. But I, I, I went, and let me tell you something. I, I showed up to that conference like a Karen, because I, I kind of was like, I kind of was like, y'all did this, you know. Y'all made this happen. Y'all said we were here for it, you know. And let me tell you something. I know what happens when you say you're here for it. You've got to be here for it. And so now y'all found out, and you kind of deserve that. So I'm, I'm kind of glad you found out your CEO and your founder were sleeping together, right? So tell me what you're going to do about that, you know. That's how I showed up at the conference. I was like, tell me what you're going to do, because I need to know, because I'm having it happen to me. Come on, go ahead. What you going to say now? And they did this whole we are the world and taught us this weird handshake because we're not allowed to touch each other anymore. I don't know. It's weird. And this was not any better to do when somebody <laughs> has had an affair. Like, they're like, they're like, we're going to, they're like, we're going to reach out and we're going to, we can't hold hands because that would be inappropriate. So instead, just put your fist out to the other person. No, no seriously. 15,000 Christians. Doing, doing the shake weight to each other while we pray. I'm just telling you what my week was like. This, this happened. And I didn't do it. They did. Okay? <laughs> but they did. They addressed it. They talked about it. And later on, they talked about covering up, Right? And this was so good because I, I, I don't know, man, when I hear about exposures happening, it just, it kind of deflates me. I'm like, man, not another one, like another pastor or another politician or another person I looked up to. Like, oh my gosh. And it feels like darkness is winning when you hear that. But th they said this, and this was so good. Listen to this. They said, the exposing of sin isn't darkness winning, it's the light winning. Amen. Don't you like that? It, it, it's, like, it's like God is going, uh-uh, you can't cover it up. 
because sin does not win. You cannot run from sin, and you cannot hide sin. I thought that was really cool. The other thing you could do is you could run from it. You could just, I'm out. I'm done. I can't. I don't even, no, I'm not going to do that. And so we could just, you could just run from it and not address the issue, just avoid it, just walk around it. These are all options. These are all things that as, as parents, as leaders, as coaches, as men and women, these are all things we're tempted to do. But God's invitation, God's invitation is for us to be here for it, to not run from it, to not avoid it, to not deny it or reject it or to cover it up, but to be here for it. And we talked about, when we talked about how we're here for it, we said this, we said, regardless of the drama, the loud noises, the early mornings, the late nights, the bad jokes, strange odors, hard questions, glitter, meltdowns, awkward conversations, nerf wars, and all of the out of control situations, we said, say it with me, we are here for it. We said that. And then we got into the messy stuff called life. And it it can be hard. It is hard. The reality starts to set in and we realize, wow, this is going to be this is going to be more than I thought. And then we start to question, are we really here for it? Because I don't know if I have what it takes, and I'm a little scared, and I don't know how it's going to work out, and the amount of sacrifice it's going to require of me, I don't know. It's easy to slap on a shirt. It's easy to say it's the theme of a conference. It's easy to say it's the, th- it's the theme for this year, but to really be he- here for it, what does it look like? There's a story of when Jesus was here for it. Peter was there. Peter saw all of this go down. He told it to one of his best buds, Mark, one of his ministry partners. He explained this to Mark, and Mark, he he wrote it down. He dictated it, and so that's how it ends up in your gospel, Matthew, Mark. Mark writes it down, and this is what Mark says. It says, one day, one day the evening came, and Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And then, this is what it says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat, and there were also other boats with him. So let me explain what just happened. There was a large crowd. Jesus just had a great service. This is at the height of his popularity. And Jesus just had a fantastic um, sermon, lesson. And there's, when it says in the Bible that there was a crowd, that means there were more people than they could count. So we're thinking this is a huge, huge crowd. And so they, they have this ginormous crowd. And I mean, think about this. this is just, they just had a great service. I mean, everybody is like, great sermon, Jesus. You know, this is awesome. This is great. And just in the middle of this awesome ending of service, Jesus looks at the 12 disciples and goes, get in the boat. Get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Come on. And they're going, what? Like, like, there's people here. There's a ton of people. Like, this is is kind of like a party, you know? We just had a great, you know? They're playing that pre-service, post-service music, you know what I mean? And they're like, no, no, no. And Jesus is like, no, in the boat. We, We need to go have a conversation. We need to take you aside. Hmm. Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus do that? You know why? The reason Jesus did that is because those 12, he, each one of them mattered to Jesus. The crowd was great. The crowd was awesome. But at a personal level, at an individual level, each of them mattered to Jesus, and Jesus saw something that needed to be addressed in their life, and so he was here for it. And so he asked them to get on a boat and to step aside so they could have a little conversation. Let me tell you something, man. I was, uh, I was strongly convicted by this this week because I'll be honest with you, I, I don't like confrontations one of my things with my self-esteem is I, I don't like when people are mad at me. If you ever text me and say, we need to have a talk, I get nervous because I immediately think I go to the worst thing that could possibly happen, the worst thing you could possibly tell me. So I don't like that. But I, I was really convicted this week because, you know, I mean, we, we, we have a crowd in my opinion. I mean, we've grown to two services and we've got a decent-sized church, you know. We, we've got a crowd but as your pastor and as your friend, 
I, I try to be as individualistic as I can, and I feel like in each of your lives, I know a lot of what's going on in your life, either because you've told me or we've talked about it, or quite honestly, you put most of your life on Facebook, so it's not hard to keep up with, you know? And so I know things about you, and I see things in your life, and I notice them, and I see patterns, because I was a pastor's kid, and I've been a pastor for over 15 years, and there are certain patterns and things I see in your life where I know how this ends, I know what you're doing, where it's going to go. And I, 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 I sometimes, I struggle because I'm like, should I say something, you know? Like, am I, am I supposed to? And there's a temptation for me to just deny it, say it's not a big deal, avoid it, don't stir the pot, cover it, just don't look at it. Think about all the nice things that are happening over here. Or, or just run from it and just avoid you and avoid what I see you doing. But can I be really honest with you how I was convicted this week? God really told me that, that if I love you like I say I do, some of you, I need to ask you to step aside and get in the boat with me and you and me need to go have a conversation. If I love you, truly love you, it's time for some of y'all, I need to talk to you about what I see in your life. And, and, you know, I've, I've just even been through this recently. There was something I saw in somebody's life, and I avoided it, and I denied it, and I ran from it. And here's the thing. It ended in the same place. We just put it off for like seven months. I knew where it was going, and I saw all the signs. Several of us in our friend group saw what you were going through and what, where, where it was going. And we just decided not to say anything about it. I decided as the pastor and as the friend to not say anything about it. And it ended up in the same place anyway. And I feel like it's time for me to put some of y'all in the boat and we need to go talk. Now none of you are going to pick up my phone calls this week. But anyway. <laughs> then what happened was a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. I found a picture this week. I got on the internet and found a picture that an artist made that he felt like depicted what this must have looked like or at least what it might have felt like. And the picture is this. Whoa, jeez. I mean, look at that. I mean, the, the boat so small and the wave is so big. And I, even, I noticed looking at it, it looks like a mouth, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got teeth. Looks dangerous, Right? Let me ask you something. Isn't this what it feels like sometimes as a parent? Mm. Isn't this what parenting feels like? Isn't this sometimes what it feels like with your anxiety or your depression? Mm. Isn't this sometimes when you're going through a crisis or grief or debt? Isn't this what debt feels like? Isn't this what grief feels like? Sometimes even when you're just alone and you're by yourself and you're on your social media and you're posting your stories and you're just trying to get somebody to connect with you or interact with you because you feel so alone, isn't this sometimes what your loneliness feels like? Hmm. In that moment, they felt like they were going to be overcome by the storm that they were against. And then Peter goes, and yeah, guess what? Guess where Jesus was, Mark? Peter says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a pillow. <laughs> and let me ask you something, real talk. Sometimes when you're dealing with that monster of a storm, doesn't it feel like that God is just snoring and asleep on a cushion? Doesn't it feel like you're going through a beast of a storm and that God doesn't even know? He's asleep. He's snoozing. And he must be so comfy. He must be so nice to not have to care. He must be so nice to not have to deal with this. And it just seems like he has put himself in a safe section of the universe while you deal with the storm. That's what it feels like sometimes, doesn't it? So the disciples, they go... They woke him up, and they said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, 
I had never thought of this before. This was said this week. There was a wonderful, wonderful female speaker who was breaking this down for us. And she said, Don't you, do, do, do you notice that the disciples didn't come to Jesus and ask Jesus, Jesus, are we going to drown? Jesus, are we going to die? No. They had already figured that they were going to die. And so their question when they come to Jesus isn't, are we going to die? Are we not going to make it? Their, their question was, we already assume that we're not going to make it. Our question for you is, do you even care? And that is the question of this generation. They've already assumed that they're not going to make it. They've already assumed that their end is near. Their question is, does Jesus even care? <laughs> and so Jesus says he got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely can you just imagine for a minute? I've, I've been in storms. We've had some storms lately. They're so loud, right? They're so, so loud. And then there comes a moment where just, when it's really, really loud, you ever, you ever been in a situation or a storm or a situation where everything was loud and then everything just went quiet? It kind of scares you to death. <laughs> Because you're like, oh my gosh, I lost my hearing now. <laughs> you know, like, it's kind of jarring and scary and stuff. That happened to us on the plane. Like, we drove into turbulence and everything was really loud and shaking. And I told Ashley, I think I'm going to throw up. And uh, she was like, do it on that lady. And anyway, and so, and, but then all of a sudden things leveled out and it's just, whoo, just silence. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of jarring. But can you imagine for just a minute with whatever you're going through right now, the storms of life, can you imagine just it being so chaotic in your mind and in your heart and in your soul and for someone to be able to just say quiet and be still and there to just be nothing? For everything to just calm down and to be still and to be peaceful? Whew. What I wouldn't give to experience that when my anxiety gets out of control. What I wouldn't give when I have certain thoughts for that to happen in my life. <laughs> what I wouldn't give for, as a parent to just stop being fearful or worried about how my children are going to turn out. To just have moments of just peace where everything was still and the chaos ended. That's what they experienced in that moment. That's what God's power did through Jesus. And then he turns to his disciples. Nobody's saying a word. It's completely silent. And Jesus says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And I don't know about you, every time I've read this verse, and I, I grew up in church, I've read this verse a thousand times. I've always assumed Jesus was mad, you know? Like, why are you afraid? Like, do you still not have faith after everything I've done? Like, what's wrong with you? But I got a different perspective this week. And she said, I don't think that's what happened. I, I think Jesus, the way he said it, was what was translated was this. Haven't you learned by now that I'm here in your deepest fear? Haven't you learned by now that when things are the most chaotic... That's when I show up. Haven't you learned by now that in the middle of the scariest places of life, that's where I become real? Isn't it true that so many a times, like the disciples, we've already pre-assumed so much? And Jesus, Jesus would say, I know you think I'm asleep, but I'm not. Jesus would say, I know you think I'm not in control, but I am. Jesus would say, I know you think, I know you've already predetermined that you're going to drown and you are going to die and that you are a failure. But let me tell you something, you're not. I would not ever let you drown and I would not ever let you get below that water. Hmm. And Jesus would say, come on, in the middle of that storm, where's your faith? In the middle of your storm, where 
Where's your faith? Is, is, your faith, is your faith in that new job? Oh, I just need to get this new job. If we could just get this new job, if we could just get this thing. Then, then the storm will calm down. Where's your faith? Is your, is your faith in the test results? And, and is your faith in the prognosis? Is your faith in the doctors? Is, is your faith in, in, in that... In, in, in that just the future, I just we just got to get through this season. We just got to get through this this period of time, and then you know what, what is your faith in? Jesus says, "Don't put your faith in anything else. Keep your eyes on me." Because here's the thing: when you when you keep your eyes on me in the middle of the storm, this is what happens. The scariest storms are where it feels like God is real. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because some of you grew up very religious. And you learned a lot of things, right? You went to VBS. You went to Sunday school. You went to catechism. You learned all the things. You learned the right things to believe. And you went through all of the hoops. And you got baptized. And you had your communion. You had your first communion. You did all of the things. And you jumped through the hoops. But then you got to be a young adult. Or you got to be an adult. And you're like, I could know all the things in the world. And it doesn't help me very much. I know a lot, but it doesn't feel like God is real. I know a lot of things. I have a lot of knowledge, and I believe all the right things, but it just doesn't feel like God is real. And what Jesus would tell you is that the problem is that you find that God is real in the scary storms of life. And here's the thing God wants for you and God wants for this generation because sometimes we try to skirt these things because we hate inconvenience. We hate scary things. We want things to be peaceful and hopeful and good and optimistic all the times, but God wants you to know. God wants you to go to the places you're most afraid because that's where you'll find him. And for the first time in your life, that is where he will sometimes feel the realest he has ever felt. Somebody just told me that yesterday, where they went through something really crazy in their life, really heartbreaking, and they didn't know what was going to happen. And so they looked up and they prayed, and guess what? God showed up. And that person said, I'm telling you what, if God was in front of me right now, I would hug him, because I've experienced this week in the scary storms of my life just how real he is. He is. That is where you find God. In the scary places. And here's the thing. For us American Christians, God isn't found in the convenience aisle of the Sunday church. You can get a glimpse of it here. I can make you cry every once in a while, okay? We can do all the right things. We can do the lights and the music and we can... Get them butterflies, you know what I mean? And we can get a little bit. But guys, that's not it. That's not the genuine thing. That's not the real deal. And I shouldn't even say that. It's not the, it is genuine. I, re I really do believe that. But I'm telling you, the real thing, I'm telling you, where you feel like God is your savior, God is your king, God is real, and if he were in front of you, you could hug him. Do you know where that is? God is realized in the trenches, in battle, and in the middle of the storm. And he wants you to go to the scary places. And guess what? There's plenty of scary places to go to in this world right now. And we want to go to those scary places. We're here for it. And we're here for it in the same way that God was here for it. In the middle, in the same way that God took those men aside and let that storm occur, knowing that that storm would happen if they got on the boat. He let it happen because it was an opportunity in the middle of the storm for them to find him. God wants us to go to those scary places. He wants us to get into the trenches. He wants us to go into battle for this next generation, for your families, for your legacy, for your soul. And he wants us to go there and be there for it. So let me ask you a question. So who's ready to go to war? Because that's what we're doing. We're going to war. Going to war for this next generation because we're not going to lose them to the world. We're not going to lose them to the enemy. We're going to war for them and we're going to war for ourselves. And we've done that in many ways. And here's just a little snapshot of what we've done just in this last year. 
We have, through our mobile food market, we have fed 1,696 families, 2,478 kids, and 3,192 adults. You can clap now if you want. That's fine. Last service, they didn't know what to do, you know? So I, I had to tell Jason, cue the laugh track, and he, you know, he did it. So we just, we played a recording. But we're on live stream now, so you guys really need to, like, perform, okay? Anyway. <laughs> My dad's watching right now, so he texted me. So. Um, this is something that we didn't have before the pandemic. This is something when our church shut down and we couldn't meet together, this is something that we created and we kept because we decided we were going to take lemons and we were going to make some lemonade. And it's pretty good lemonade. But also, something else we didn't have was an online ministry. And let me tell you about what happens online. Right now, people who are watching right now, Derek's doing the cameras and Sarah is, is running our feed. This last year, we have had 16,340 views. There have been 1,210.7 hours of our content watched and our viewership is up 157 percent just in the last year that's how impactful our online ministry is it's not just reaching lincoln county warren county st charles county it's going much further than that and for some of you this was your even your introduction to us right just watching those little clips and or watching a sermon or listening to our podcast that's that's part of our ministry and how we're impacting the world Man, it gets even better than that. We also, this last year, we gave away $20,000 to local nonprofits, $9,000 to mission work outside the U.S., $20,000 to the affordable Christmas shop, $11,000 to support local churches in Missouri in need, $3,622 in college scholarships, $2,000 in local school supplies. You can clap again, yeah. That was me turning it off. No, it's good. Let me tell you something. We did all of this on a budget of $224,000. Now, let me tell you something. Some of y'all aren't church smartened up, okay? But let me tell you something. The other churches in our community who are about our size are bigger. They are, I, I know this, they, they're dealing with budgets that are over a million dollars a year. It's amazing that we are able to do everything that we do in our community and for you with a budget of $224,000. We are loaves and fishes, man. Like we take a little and we can sure do a whole lot. That is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And then this last year, our congregation has doubled in size. We've had 14 baptisms, 27 new members, and a ton of life-changing stories. These are just some of the things that we can measure and we can celebrate. And this isn't the end-all, be-all, okay? Our mission is to inspire people to follow Jesus by engaging them in the life and mission of the church. But these are things that we can point out to and go, wow, that's really cool. Hey, that's really grown. Hey, that's really cool. And, and so we're, we're seeing that and we're doing that. But we're not done yet. Because as we grow, we want to ensure that this, we make a large church still feel like a small church. Because we don't want anyone to feel like just a number. We don't want anyone to slip through the cracks we don't any, and want anyone to be able to be gone for months at a time and then come in and nobody notice. And so this is something new that we're going to be doing this year. We're going to be doing connecting events. And these connecting events are gateways to help you stay involved and to get to have friends and connection within the church. So we're going to have connecting, connecting events for men, women, singles, young adults, married people, and empty nesters as well. And we are finding leaders right now. And if any of you would like to help with any of this, this is, this is awesome. This is like our single people. They're going to play laser tag here in a couple weeks. And they're going to go out to dinner. And they're forming relationships. And they're helping one another in that season of life. That's what we want to do with each of these seasons of life. And so we're finding leaders who are going to create these connecting points. And every month, you're going to see certain ones. So in June, you're going to see a young adults one. You're going to see a women's one. And they're going to be affordable. They're going to be a small time commitment. And they're going to be times for you to connect with other people in your season of life. Now, we have done a lot, 
And we have a lot to do. But here's another thing I need to talk to you about. Last year, we had the fourth lowest giving year of all time. And 35% of our giving came from the tithes and offerings of our four staff members. We had a finance team meeting in March, end of the year. And again, I don't know what anybody gives, okay? I don't count the money. I don't get a report of what you gave or anything like that, okay? I see the in and I see the out. And we sat down and we were $40,000 off budget. We had to take $40,000 out of our savings to do what we had committed to do. I told you a couple months ago, we were bringing somebody in to interview because we wanted to shift Pastor Ashley to children's and hire somebody new to be our youth pastor. I sat down with the finance team meeting and wrote out a budget, and they said, you can't do it. You can't afford to hire anybody. I'm like, well, what are our options? They said, well, you and Ashley are working really, really hard. Maybe you guys should just work harder and do some fundraisers. <laughs> And then you could get some help so you don't have to work so hard. And I said, this seems weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so we sat down and we looked at this and we talked about it. And I said, that can't be right. Like, we must be, this, there must be some money underneath this shelf or something that we're hiding or something. Like, this can't be right. Because, I mean, here's the thing. Like, we just doubled in size. We just doubled in size. And I mean... That's, that, 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 that can't be right. But took the amount, and I know how much I give, and I know how much our staff gives. I know that they tithe 10% every single week, like clockwork. And I added that up, and I was like, that'd be about 30 to 35% of what we brought in this year. That means it came from us. And I don't know if y'all know this or not. We're either pastored, pastors or retired missionaries or, part, or full-time teachers. So y'all all know what pastors and part-time, full-time teachers and retired missionaries make, okay? It's not a lot. <laughs> so how in the world is that possible? And here's the thing, man. When I discovered all this, I've rehearsed a lot of things I would love to say right now. Uh, leadership team. Leadership team has told me some things that they think I should say. <laughs> and the leadership team has offered some solutions to the to the problem, they've said, well, maybe we just need to stop being so generous. You just saw the list of the amount of money we've given away this year. Maybe we just shouldn't do that. But here's my thinking on that. You tell me if I'm right or not. I thought you were a part of this church because this church was a church not like other churches. And one of the reasons you were drawn to it is how much we are generous and how much we do for our community. So our leadership team is thinking maybe we just be like all the other churches in the community and just take care of ourselves. And then if we have any left over, we take care of everybody else. But that's not the kind of church we want to be, right? Okay, then. Okay, then. And I'll say this, too. The leadership team would love me to come in here with some Bible verses and put out the biblical explanation of why this is important. But I'm going to go a little bit different route because I'll be honest with you. When I saw that 35% of the giving was coming from me and my team and that apparently part of the problem is that a lot of people aren't participating in it, I was personally hurt by that. And I'm saying this, I'm not saying this to everybody. When I say it, you'll know if it's meant for you or not. Because some of you I'm very close with and we're friends. And I, you tell me that I mean a great deal to you. And I believe you when you say that to me. So I'm saying this to you. I thought this was our church and we were in this together. And I'll be honest with you. When I found out how much I'm sacrificing... When I found out how much I'm sacrificing and that you're not at all, it hurts me personally. So I'm not going to go the Bible verse approach. I'm just going to tell you how I feel. And again, I don't know what you give, so I don't know who you are, but it hurts. So here's where we're going. We've committed to the direction and the mission of this church. And so we cannot hire anybody to come on and be a part of this team. What we got is what we got. And Pastor Ashley 
has a call to ministry and is committed enough that she is going to be taking over youth full-time and children's full-time. So birth to 20 is Ashley's, which was so fun this week as we went to this conference of <laughs> next-gen ministry, children's ministers and youth ministers. We, every hour, we'd go to these breakout sessions, and we'd go to these tables, and we'd sit around, and the first introductory question was, hi, I'm so-and-so. Uh, I look over this age group, and so it was like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I look over middle schoolers. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I look over uh, toddlers, and they like turn to Ashley, and they're like, hi, what's your name? And Ashley's like, hi, I'm Ashley. If they're under the age of 30, that's my job. And everybody was like, oh, my gosh, you poor girl. Who did that to you? And I was like, hi, I'm Mike. <laughs> Great for my soul this week. <laughs> Made me feel so good. Uh, but that's where we are. And I applaud. I applaud Ashley for her commitment to our mission and for her commitment to your teens and your kids. So we sat down, and we've had a lot of conversations about what Ashley thinks is God's vision for our ministry to Next Gen. And we came up with a mission statement. This is what we want to do. We want kids and teens to have an everyday faith that transforms and informs how they love God, themselves, and others. This is what we want for our kids. And we have sat down and we have seen the scope of the curriculum that we are going to use in this next year. This next year, all the way from our littles to our, or to our uh, grade school kids to our teens, we are going to talk about. We're going to address issues on failure, anxiety, depression, crisis, body image, passions, creativity, social justice, prayer, resiliency, and so much more. We are going to talk about the things they are not able to talk about anywhere else, but they are going to YouTube and TikTok to find answers to. We are going to be their source for information. We are going to give them the compass that points them to the truth. We are going to be here for it, and we are going to help them navigate through the difficult situations and through the scary storms. But it didn't just stop there. We are also going to have quarterly events that are family experiences. And the first one is going to be on July 27th. It's going to be called Summer Jam. And it is going to be an event for kids and parents where you don't drop off your kid. This ain't VBS. We ain't a Christian daycare around here. You are going to come with your kids. And it is going to be a family experience where you're going to get to listen to music and play games and create things together and have create memories with one another that is going to last and take your family through the next steps of your faith journey. To make all this possible, what Ashley wants to do is she wants to give our kids the same quality as what you get in here. And so on May 13th, we're going to be tearing down walls in our children's department to open it up and to create a space big enough where our first through fifth graders will be together every single week. And they will have a backdrop just like this. There will be a TV, and Ashley will be teaching in person. There will be no more teaching videos unless she is gone, and she'll be teaching in person. She's also going to be leading them in worship, and so your kids are going to get to experience worship every single week and get to have the same quality of speaking and education and teaching that is done here in this room. Isn't that cool? There's a lot of other stuff we're going to do, too. There's a lot of other things that are going to impact our youth and our, our, our kids. And here's the thing I believe. Impacting next gen is going to benefit every single one of us. And so to do this, what's going to happen in May, this whole turnaround that's going to happen, and it's all going to be done by June. First week of June is, is promotion Sunday. We're going to have a big party here at the church. We're going to have ice cream Sundays. Your kids are going to move up and stuff. We're going to have a really fun day, and it's all going to be done. But here's the thing. That project is going to cost us $10,000. $10,000. Oh, there's one more thing I forgot, too. There's another thing that we've noticed, and this isn't a bad thing, so I'm not knocking anybody. But we've noticed, too, that something has shifted in the world to where there are a lot of kids 
or parents who keep their like babies and kids in here, which if you have a baby or kid in here, do not feel bad or squirm. I'm sorry, Carter, I see you. Um, it's not a bad thing, it's just, it's just a cultural thing because here's what we've realized. This generation does not feel safe dropping their kid off to a nursery. And I understand it. You want to hold your baby. You love that baby. And there's been a lot of things that have happened that have created some scarcity mindset. So we understand it. And this isn't just happening at our church. It's across the board. We talk to people about this all week. So the other thing we're going to be doing is we are going to be doing away with our nursery model. And we are going to be creating what's called a family lounge. And it's going to have nice leather couches and stuff that recline and different things. And then our sermon is going to be... um, streamed on that TV. There's going to be cameras in there for safety reason. There's going to be a volunteer in there to answer any of your needs that you might need. And so that way, if you want to bring your child into service, by all means, they are welcome to. We're totally here for it. But if there's a point where they like start screaming their head off and you get uncomfortable, you can go down to our family lounge and have a place instead of, you know, sitting on those creepy stairs out there and look at me. I can see you, by the way, out there. Um, but you know what I'm saying? So there will be a family lounge that you'll be able to go to too. So that's cool too. But anyway, this project is going to cost us $10,000. And so today is Give Big Sunday. And this is what you are going to give big towards. You're going to give big to next gen. And next month, every third Sunday, we're going to tell you about something else we're doing that is for the benefit of somebody else. And we want you to give big towards it over and beyond what you normally give. And if you don't give it all, to give towards something bigger than yourself, to empty a part of yourself for the benefit of someone else. Is this not what we've talked about again and again and again? Is this not who we're supposed to be as Christians? We want you to give big for next gen. Now, here's what happened. Thursday night, we had a, a great night, you know. We had a great conference, Ashley and I, and, and it was terrific. And we're just on a high. I don't know if you ever... If you grew up in church, you know, you remember, remember summer camp, church camp, you know, you're on that church camp high, you know, you just, you come off the bus on Friday, I am a C, I am a C-H, you know what I mean? And you're just, you know, revival high, you know what I mean? Some of y'all are assembly of God, you remember like that sixth service and you're just, you know, you're there. So Ashley and I were there like Thursday night, you know. We've been doing like 15-hour services for four days, okay? So we've had 60 ounces of coffee, zero water, and we love Jesus, okay? (laughs) And Ashley, one thing I learned about her, dear God, she has a sweet tooth. And I felt like a parent at times because she kept begging me to go buy her desserts. And I, like a child, was like, no, you've had your quota for today. You can't, no. And so she was begging me all week. I'm sorry, this is so much information. Uh, (laughs) She was begging me all week to get a chocolate milkshake. And I was like, no, we had crepes this morning, woman. What is your problem? So anyway, um, I talked to her mother about it last night. It's a whole thing. So anyway, I told her, Thursday night, I will take you to go get a stupid chocolate milkshake. And um, man, there was this terrible mix-up at the car place. Like we had to rent a car, and there was this terrible mix-up. They put us in a Dodge Challenger. I've never felt so cool in my life. (laughs) My tattoos meant so much, you know. I'm (laughs) driving around Atlanta in a black Dodge Challenger. It's just, I have problems now. Anyway, so we're driving around Atlanta, and I told Ashley, I'll get you a chocolate milkshake. And so I told her, I said, I'm going to drive you to one of my favorite places. And I drove her to my, my favorite church, North Point Church, that just means so much to me. So I got her a chocolate milkshake. We're driving this Dodge Challenger. You know, it's beautiful weather and stuff. And I take her, and this, this is the picture we took. Um, they have this mural outside of their building that says, Give, Serve, Love. And so there's Ashley. She, she does this rock and roll thing, but she has this bad habit of turning her hand like this. And so it looks like she's flipping you the bird. She's not. <laughs> She, she does it a lot. She just needs to turn her stupid wrist this direction. But it looks like she's like, you know, and it's like, after the week we had of all this stuff, I was like, whatever, you know. But anyway, so then we, we go back. We, we always, it, it, everything ended late, and then we'd go to the hotel lobby and work. And so I'm literally, I'm working on this message that I'm sharing with you now. And it's, it's late, okay. And I get a DM, I get a TM, and, and this is what the DM said. This is from one of our teenagers in our church. I'm really sorry for coming out of the blue, and I don't know what to do anymore. 
people at school are mean to me for stuff I didn't do, and I have nobody anymore. I walk by myself every day, and what breaks my heart is that I can't seem to make everybody happy. I feel worthless. I have no clue what to do anymore. I'm all by myself, and I'm tired of putting a fake face on. I can't even bring myself to smile at all. I feel so invisible, and I am praying every night. I went from being on a high to feeling very low. My hands started to shake. I had to put it on the table. And I understood in that moment that when we go home, we're going to war. It's all fun and games, and it's good stuff. But when we get home, we are going to war. And this is day one. This is day one. There is a war, and there is a battle going on. And it's not a battle that can be won with a revival or a prayer meeting or a VBS. This war has to be fought different. And this war has to be fought different than any other war that the church has ever fought. But here's one thing I'm confident about. We have the strategy to win. We know what needs to be done. God has given us the vision for it. And we are going to do it. And we are going to be overcomers. One of the great quotes that I heard this week. This is so good. This was shared on stage. He said this. He said, what the next generation needs is not so much for you to hurl your wisdom at them from a distance, but to catch their tears up close. When you walk into a community, look at the eyes and look at the floors. And this is what he said next. A place acquainted with the Lord is a place where tears flow freely, but the floors stay dry because everyone has a shoulder to cry on. That cooks, doesn't it? You know what? That's the kind of church I want us to be. I want this to be a church where we break down the walls and we break down the barriers and your tears can flow freely, but they will not touch the floor because you will have somebody who is here for it. You will have somebody who is here for you what Ashley said would become real. You will know that you are loved and that you are important and that you matter and we are here for it. God is in the storm with us and God has the power we need to calm the storm. I believe in the promises of Jesus. I believe that when Jesus said, to, to Peter, when he said, I tell you this, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I believe that everything that we are up against, none of it will win. None of it will defeat us. None of it will win our kids or take our kids from us. None of it can overcome the power of God. And I believe in what Jesus said when he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. I believe, folks, that Jesus has given us the keys to the kingdom. He has given us the strategy to win. And he has given us the people we need and the leaders we need. And I'm telling you what, I'm tired of screwing around. And I will do this with whatever it takes. I will do this till the wheels fall off of it. I will go down with the ship if that is what it takes. I am committed to this. I am committed to seeing this through. And I know we can win because I know who my God is. And I believe that if our eyes are on him and our faith is in him, that we and the next generation will see the power of God in display and God will become very real in their life. And they will all look up and they will say what those men said on that boat, what kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we worship. And the kingdom of God has come near. 
Repent and believe. So the band's going to come back up. And now is your chance to give big. Now is your chance to be all in for next gen. Now is your chance to be here for it and to be here for them. So you can give online at anchoredhope.church forward slash give. It's on our website. It's clear as day. You can give physical donation today. You could drop an empty envelope. You could take that envelope and somebody will think there's something in it and you can drop it in the basket so that you don't feel weird. Whatever you feel like. Look, here's the thing. I'm not here to judge and I don't know what you're about to do. All I know is where we're going and all I know is that I'm trusting God. And I'm trusting God with every part of my life. And I'm trusting God with this. And I know that no matter what happens, whether you're in this or not, God's got it. And so I'm riding it till the wheels fall off. But if you want to be a part of it, if you want to find the place where God feels real in the middle of the storm, then I want to invite you to participate. I want you to be just not a a tender of this church. Be part of the war. Be part of the mission. Be part of what we are about to do. And I believe you'll be better for it. Will you stand with me this morning? Father God, as we come to you today, Father God, we don't have a lot, but with the little we have, we honor you. God, you've given us a vision, a vision, you've given us a clear direction, you've given us a strategy, you've given us the map, and it is a scary, scary, scary journey, but God, I believe you've got us, and you're in this, and you're going to do amazing things through us. You've given us the king of the kingdom. And we can bind up these storms. We can loosen these things that have people latched up and caught up. God, I believe that we have everything we need. It's right here in this room. It's in these people. It's in this community. It's in these leaders. It's in these people who you've called to be part of this church. Every single one of them matters. Every single one of them has a piece to play. And in the middle of these trenches that we're about to go in over these next five, 10 years, you're gonna do amazing things in us and through us. And God, I believe, I believe that as we plant these seeds today, as today is day one of this, that I believe that in this next chapter, in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see such a huge harvest. We're gonna see a generation grow up. We're gonna see them take over the church. We're gonna see them be leaders. We're gonna see them be pastors. We're gonna see them be teachers in the back. We're gonna see them be greeters at the front door. We're gonna see them be people on here on stage who are leading us in worship and sharing the gospel message. We're gonna see something mighty powerful, and we are going to be a light in the dark place. We're going to change this world. We're going to help the next generation because we're here for it because you were here for us, dear God. And so we pray that in your name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. This is a move. This is what we need. And so that's what we're going to sing about today as the ushers come. Will you worship with us today?